Since we've been born, most of us have been breathing quite all right, actually, wouldn't you say? So why does breathing for singing tie us up in such knots? Perhaps you're a teacher whose go-to exercises usually focus on the breath. Maybe you find yourself working on finding splat release in singers often. Or maybe you're a teacher who doesn't really do any breath work with singers, finding results elsewhere. Well, this is why we have MDH breathing coordination coach and teacher of Voice Unlocked and ISMP, Lucinda Allen, joining us this week to help us understand what is involved in an optimal inhalation to help inspire our singing. Lucinda, I know what you're thinking. Alexa doesn't look a day over 21, but I have actually been existing for about 35 plus years, partly because breathing has been doing well for me so far. So why is it then that when we come to breathe for singing, we can get so tied up in knots? Great question. Such a great start question. Yeah, I I thought that myself many years ago as well as a singer and then continued to ask that question as a vocal coach um, and now a, uh, a breathing coordination specialist. But I I think one of the things that, well, that really occurs to me is that we are doing specific types of breathing. Uh, we come into sort of habitual patterns. We get into a rhythm of breathing based on what we're doing on a daily basis. So most of us are spending quite a lot of time sat at a laptop or a phone. Um, some of us are going to the gym and doing some dynamic exercise, but not potentially uh, singing or vocalizing at the same time. And we we have these patterns that I think sort of sit within our lives. And when it comes to singing, we do need depending on the task to alter that pattern that set of um cues that we're giving to the body um and i think sometimes that bridge between what we're doing during the day what we're habitually getting into patterns with and where we need to take it to singing doesn't that bridge doesn't always get crossed as efficiently as it possibly could do so yes we're all surviving and alive and breathing but ooh, we're not always breathing as optimally as we could do for the task that we are um, taking part in. I think that's yeah. probably a great place to start. Yeah, and I guess it's one of those really unconscious systems and that we just don't have to think about. And thank goodness we don't have to think about it because if we had to add that to our to-do list as well, I think it would just be the the straw that breaks the camel's back, if you will. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, there's so many things, isn't there? And we can... We only have to go on the internet for five minutes to find so much advice on on the voice, but even just breathing alone um, for for singing and voicing. So yeah, you're absolutely right. So building it into our habitual patterns um, is is the most helpful way of actually integrating it into performance because we can do all these like fabulous exercises, but ultimately if it's not there serving us when we perform then it's not integrated enough. And you're right, we have lots of things to think about as people, but also as singers, lyrics, when we're um, starting our line within the music, you know, hitting the right note and actually breath being something we can trust, um, I think is something that we're, as singers, striving for quite often. So what are the, the three most common challenges that you see singers experience the most, which could be related to the way in which their breathing or the way that breathing is impacted? Mm. Yeah, one of the ones I, I see so often is um, voice stamina and sustainability. So singers looking for that reliable voice that they can use eight shows a week or three gigs over a week, three or four gigs over a weekend, you know, is their voice sustaining and serving them across that schedule that they have as a singer uh, or as a voice user? So that's definitely something that I see very, very often um, in a more kind of global way. Um, and then sort of narrowing down from that, I see um, clients and students uh, wanting to extend their exhale to be able to sing longer notes, longer phrases. You know, it's a competitive world in the music industry these days and, you know, finding ways to be unique and, and express ourselves and, um, yeah, sort of sustaining notes um, is, is something else that I see. Um, and also I think breath in terms of um, actually feeling 
confidence in performance is something as well uh, when it comes to the mindset and that body connection with the mind and how that works in line with the voice are kind of the main things uh, that I see. But I would say say voice stamina and sustainability is is one of the biggest that I hear from clients. Yeah. Different tasks are going to perhaps demand different things from the breath. So how can we actually tell the difference between breathing being the cause of a vocal difficulty and when breathing and the experience of that is just a sign of something else that needs to be fixed? Mm, it's a really good question. It's kind of chicken and egg, isn't it? You know, what what is it we're looking at first? Um, with the work that I do, I almost always uh, look at breath first. Um, I forgive me for not knowing where this sentence came from, but it's always stuck with me that the voice is the breath made audible. And I think looking at the breath can give us a really good um, insight and a cue um, as to why something else might be occurring. And so often we're looking at people hitting the higher notes or pitch accuracy, longer phrases, tone, support, all these kind of things. And when you really bring it back down, for me, it does start with how we're using our breaths. Um, so in that loop of chicken and egg, or what is it that is the core of the issue? I nearly always come back to breath first um, as a first port of call because it actually gives us a really good cue of, well, if something is not happening, if the airflow isn't stable, if the airflow isn't slow and steady, then that's going to be very difficult to serve actually a really big number of things that we think about when it comes to vocal technique. Um, and I think sometimes we can do it the other way around. We can try and fix the support system or we can try and fix getting a really efficient, safe belt. But actually we're trying to do it without looking at the the fuel and the power source and the the inspiration of all of that stuff. I mean, the breath is inspiration and a big belty note comes from how we inspire that. So I think starting with the breath is for me the, the, the place I would usually go to. On the opposite end of that then, have you noticed there being particular challenges that just cannot be solved or improved through breath work? Yeah, really good question. I mean, I based on the work that I've done um, in with breathing coordination, we look at the breath, but we have to look at the body at the same time as the breath because, of course, uh, they are hand in hand. I actually believe that we can all optimize our breath in some way. Um, so I sound like a massive um, the fan of the breath here, which you now it's why I invested in in breathing coordination because there this is quite a strong statement, but there are very few things I haven't found haven't improved by looking at how we manage our air, whether it be the air flow or whether it be how we manage and hold air or how we release air um, and breath. So, oh, that's quite a difficult question, but I, I've actually not found, I mean, unless someone, I mean, even when someone has a pathology or something going on with their voice, they've got some concerns with their voice, maybe they've been and had a scope and had their vocal cords looked at. I, I can't imagine a scenario where looking at breath wouldn't be helpful when there's um, concerns that are going on or something is clearly um, perhaps more of a psychological issue and there needs to be in intervention from a professional with um, that sort of psychological, mental health background, all of that kind of thing. I think then leaning into that work um, is also really helpful, but then it's making sure that the breath work we're doing is complementing that. Um, because I think, you know, the breath really does also mirror what's going on emotionally. And I think if you're doing one thing in your breath work and then you're doing another thing in your mindfulness work and they're not always, they're not speaking to each other or complement each other, you could actually be undoing some really good work you're doing in one of those two places. Under the principles of breathing coordination, I'm just quoting something from the website here. It states how 
Balanced vocal production is a necessary tool for the redevelopment of the individual's breathing coordination. And a lot of time you might get singers who come in and say, I need to work on my breathing. That's my goal. But when can we tell if that's the appropriate place to start or without dismissing them, go somewhere else and work on another part of the system? Yeah, I think that accurate diagnosis of of the of well, first of all knowing why like why is it as a client or a student you think that you need to work on your breasts um and I and that's without judgment that's actually get me getting closer to the client or the student's instincts um and I think a lot of the time our instincts are actually bang they can be bang on they can be really close to um and really helpful bits of information for us so I would definitely ask the client or the student why do you think you need to work on your breathing And then quite often from that, we can start to get more information. Well, I can't, um, I'm not very good at having long phrases or I feel like I run out of air. These kind of quite uh, classic things that I hear. And then that can get us to build a much clearer picture or a map of that individual. So if they're saying things like I'm running out of air, then I'd say, okay, so let's talk about how that feels. What's going on in terms of the feel of this? And then if they get stuck with, well, I just feel really dry after I've been singing that long phrase, I'll say, okay, so that sounds like there's lots of air going over the vocal cords. Can you tell me a bit more about how that affects when you sing? Oh, well, my voice starts cutting out. So actually, I think really listening to the person when they say that and then helping them unpack it can get us a little bit closer to um, more of the detail. And that's what I really love about MDH breathing coordination is that it's it's very Swiss, it's very detailed, <laughs> and it um, very much honors the uh, two-way partnership of coaching, which I love, which is what are you bringing? What's your, because um, no one knows their voice better than themselves, right? So just what is it that you have noticed, you see, you hear, you feel, um, in your voice and then let me help you um, understand that with some feedback from me as well so some of the principles around the work are actually involve touch and someone might report to me that they're struggling with their breathing Um, and instead of just watching them breathe or listening to them breathe I can actually help inform that question a little bit more by putting my hands on their ribs and helping them actually clarify a little bit more detail on what they actually mean by they need help with their breathing Um, because sometimes it's really great to hear oh do you know what your ribs move really well in that part of your rib cage and that's oh okay so it is working a bit Um, and also do you know what I feel like your body could offer you a bit more movement here so what you're feeling you know is true we could get a bit more optimization from your breath but let's work out together a journey of how we can optimize what's not broken it's not broken it's just we can optimize it a bit more to help you with the task that you want to uh, do in terms of performance or song you're one of the uk's first breathing coordination specialists so what was it about breathing training or breathing for singing that really interested you in particular yeah um so what many years ago when i studied voice myself i I think it was of of that time where there weren't many places for us to go and learn about voice. In fact, we had our singing teachers. You'd have um, some really great people that I engaged with on my journey through learning about my own voice. Um, But I also had people in my, uh, some colleagues of mine that were going through voice problems and were kind of advised on different things like, um, you know, techniques that they should use to help them with their voices and um some of the advice I was me as a big empath I kind of like grated on me a little bit like some of the extreme advice of kind of singing through the pain or kind of just soldiering on and that era of really trying to um be the best with effort and I kind of got I got quite curious and I went on a bit of a rampage of going to as many conferences as I could possibly go to to the point where I really wanted to become a coach myself to help um, others, but through a way of kind of unpacking in a collaborative way and asking 
specialists, but also asking colleagues of things that they experienced with their voice, which of course is closely linked to breath. Um, and, you know, went on on this kind of rampage of, of conferences. And I often saw so many fabulous uh, people speaking from lots of different countries, but obviously with different expertise. And it was fantastic. And there were moments where I really connected with what the people were saying. Um, and during this time, I got a little bit cur more curious and um, actually ended up working in a physiotherapy cl clinic for about 10 years um, working alongside physios, um, voice massage therapists, um, speech and language therapists, and had the privilege of delving a little bit deeper um, by um, seeing physios work with ultrasounds and looking at how the body worked in more detail. So I started to get a bit of a crossover between the medical world and the creative performance world and realized there was a quite a big gap between the way we're coaching singing and teaching singing and the medical world where if people were having issues and concerns with their bodies, what kind of, kind of advice they would get. And it started to occur to me that we went, we could not step on each other's toes, but actually share expertise a little bit more and, and help singers in a more informed way. Um, and it was at one particular conference where I was watching a presentation by someone called Robin De House, who is the pioneer of MDH breathing coordination. And when I was hearing him speaking, he was talking about how breathing techniques shouldn't just be generalized. It's not a one size fits all, but more a bespoke approach to the individual. And that really hit home with me because as I was studying to be a teacher in a uh, formal teacher qualification at, at that time I was hearing lots about student-centered approach like the way we teach should be about the student and then this breathing singing method I was hearing about MDH breathing coordination was about putting the singer at the center and finding methods that work for them rather than trying to press a technique on them and then it just it kind of lit up a million light bulbs for me and went I need to find out more about this method it really aligns with the questions that I have um, and then I flew to Switzerland a million times to study to be a practitioner and started integrating it into my practice I I really want to go to Switzerland it's on my it's on my list to go to it's just so beautiful so I mean if that's not enough to attract somebody to go and maybe look at MDH breathing I don't know what is it looks so beautiful so were you in the in the mountains I, I don't know why I'm envisioning that it to be there yeah no it, it really was um so uh when I studied with Robin I mean it's the most beautiful space and it really put some of the teaching spaces we have in the UK to shame you know a beautiful grand piano looking out over a lake with mountains and then a little collection of Swiss chocolate um in the corner of the room was um yeah a very <laughs> a very wonderful um environment to study in but also it was just so great to meet voice practitioners and people fascinated about voice um in one space that you know outside of the UK and actually a lot of those specialists were people that were coming from med medical backgrounds that wanted to use MDH breathing coordination in their practices um so psychologists that yes singing teachers um people that work with with young children people that have um concerns with um asthma and general breathing so it's a a principle that works fabulously for for speaking and singing but also people were finding it incredibly helpful to learn more about uh, the function of breathing you mentioned there that it's to do with being individual and student-centered and that you can use your hands and that sort of thing. But what are the main principles of that that it's built upon that you then follow or implement? Yeah, so the main principles are about optimizing the function of breathing. And that's done by not just, you know, the traditional approach that we might have in a singing lesson where it you know, there's a student stood the other side of a piano, but actually tapping into more of the feedback that we have available to us as humans. And um, the the method is actually 
Swiss French. So some of the words are translated from French, which um, I had to kind of, I mean, I don't speak very good French, but I definitely had to learn a few words. Um, but some of the translations are really beautiful about listening um, and about listening with our hands. So, of course, we're listening to a singer sing across the piano or we're uh, watching their body, parts of their body move when they sing. But the touch, the power of touch to actually feel what's happening in a really um, informed way, I think, empowers the individual to feel like there is an extra link between us to help them with what's happening. So in an, in a standard session, we do a really detailed diagnosis or a, analysis of where someone is at with their voice and body uh, um, and breath currently. So that involves a conversation of the history of the uh, client or student and their current practice and what their goals are, as you would in a usual session. And then to learn more about that individual's uh, body breath and function uh, we use a, a, a t table like a massage table and we work through the breathing chain working right from the legs through the shoulders and um, back of the neck and then look at the ribs and the work is really really gentle and it's more about using the hands to listen to what the body is um, not only in terms of flexibility and mobility but how it's moving and that's one of the biggest differences I've found in my personal practice is not just watching how something moves when we breathe, but not how something moves when we sing, but actually can we notice how it changes and what parts of the body could serve us better? So we do a check through the, through the breathing system and then the work looks to re-coordinate the body with the breath and then re-coordinate -co the breath into the voice because sometimes we can do a physical thing and then implement it implement it right back into the voice and miss um, quite a big catch in the chain so doing a shoulder roll might be really helpful and then we might sing straight away but that might not be enough of a clearer message for our body to understand what we want it to do so the physical touch actually helps me guide the ribs really gently on an inhale and an exhale for a student and then guide the ribs and other parts of the body if necessary when we voice. And it's that process that I think really clears up helping people understand what happens when we inhale, what happens when we exhale, what happens when we close the vocal cords and use the voice and how can we optimize those processes. The power of touch, we know how beneficial that can be. But for teachers who aren't trained in MDH breathing coordination, who might be in institutions where it's highly encouraged that you don't touch the pupil un unless absolutely necessary or unless there's another person in the room, a lot of us are actually working from the basis of not touching. So how can we still find those beneficial results without being hands-on yeah such a good question so quite a few years ago when I started learning the work I had the same sort of reflections I was like I don't want to put myself in a position where you know um any of these kind of <laughs> things could occur where you know we have to respect boundaries some people just don't want that kind of um, interaction and I have to say probably 95% of people that I do work with are like, yes, absolutely, whatever you need to do. But there, there is, of course, a small group of people that are not comfortable with, with touch. Um, so what I would say is that this work for me was at the point where we were, well, we went into lockdown actually. So I was in full flow of this work and seeing the benefits and seeing how we can speed up the process of students and clients learning better about how their body functions so I was then thrown into lockdown and me myself I was teaching full classes of vocal technique and one-to-ones on zoom and I suddenly it suddenly occurred to me now I can't I've got that extra listening tool that's gone so I had to redesign this um, online for obviously a couple of years and at that point um, it 
made me realize that yes touch from another person is extremely powerful for guiding the body in the directions that it needs to go in but also we can re-empower which is actually more even more helpful in some ways the individual to use their own touch on their own bodies so um actually i think it's quite rare to sort of be singing and performing a song and being empowered to use touch I mean yes when you see someone practicing singing you'll see with them with their hand on their abdomen that's quite a con a, a common image isn't it to see someone with their hand on their uh, at the front of their body but actually to be a little bit more explorative of okay what what are our top ribs doing what's our back doing what do I notice about my shoulder blades over my back ribs what do I notice about the very top of my spine let me put my hand there and and use touch to get that feedback about ourselves so actually I would really empower anyone that's thinking about using touch to and particularly when we're teaching online to ask someone to put their hand there and say how does that feel what direction do you feel that part of the body moving in does that feel comfortable like really empowering a dialogue because I think sometimes we as coaches can feel like we should know straight away the answer to something otherwise we're not a good teacher but actually an open conversation of how does that feel? How does how does that move is super empowering. I think that builds a really beautiful bond between the coach and the student because they feel like you genuinely want to know about them and you want to help them. So it's just, yeah, empowering touch in an individual, individual, that's quite hard to say, individualized way as well for our clients and students. Breathing has got me in knots at times as a teacher because I think I, I think I understand what we're trying to aim for but then it gets completely skewed when I think what this person is actually then going on to do so thinking about the inhale for you what are we trying to achieve all round with our singers when we're taking an inhale an in-breath mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is where it gets really important, I think, to do a really good assessment because there are lots of thoughts about whether we should breathe in the in the tummy at the front, if we should look, be widening the ribs at the side, should we be expanding the back? Um, you know, there's lots of thoughts on this and this is why it's so important to go back to checking in with where someone is at the start of their, well, when I start working with someone, I always do this because it's not necessarily, in my opinion, wrong that someone's been doing loads of be belly breathing or wrong they've been doing lots of this. But actually, what I want to know is what are your habitual patterns? So if someone's done lots of years of, you know, very uh, front, front based release, then they're going to have more of that connection with their body. So in a way you could say that your body's serving you incredibly well there in fact you're, you may even be over releasing into the front of the body and perhaps there's other parts of the body around the sides and back which could offer you even more so I think I would check in first of all what are you doing already and then where is there more possibility for you so um not you know not trying to make them feel like they're doing anything wrong but there's just more that your body could offer you so um checking in to feel okay so it's a little bit there's a bit of a lack of movement in this part around around the back and I think we forget that the diaphragm does connect all the way around um and we've got that sort of 360 degree panoramic thing so to just put your hand at your front of your body using touch again isn't necessarily drawing our mind to the fact that we have that full panoramic approach. Um, so yes, I think, you know, we want a movement all the way around. And actually for me, it's less about whether one's right or wrong or not. It's actually, we want a balanced um, movement of the diaphragm. So if you're doing lots of release at the front, you could almost have a slightly lopsided approach that there's a lot of movement happening at the front of the body. So we might want to rebalance that coordination and actually find methods and ways um, to guide and encourage movement around the whole uh, body. So when people have got lots of re release at the front of the body, I would work with them more to encourage a 360 degree approach of movement around the whole body. And I think 
we can actually forget how much of a part the ribs play in that. We can get all a little bit obsessed, I think, with the diaphragm if we're not too careful. And of course, it's incredibly important. But the thing that we can actually touch and feel and have more of a connection with are our ribs. Um, so I almost from day one get my clients to think more about their ribs, the flexibility of their ribs um, or not, because quite often we have quite a lot of a hold in the ribs got those beautiful muscles that sit between the ribs and can easily become compressed, which can inhibit the inhale. So uh, a lot of the MDH breathing coordination work works on rib release and mobility and um, allows for the inhale to beautifully drop in. And we can get that cue, can't we? Just let the breath in, let the breath drop in. And it's like, I can't. And it might not be able to happen because we're, we are literally locked um and in english we call it a rib cage right but actually i think in german um it's rib basket and when we start thinking about the ribs like a basket we can actually encourage an idea of a 360 degree stretch not just at the diaphragm um in fact at that whole breathing path which goes into the ribs um so i would i would encourage a release and expansion and yes a recoil because we we want the breath to drop in we don't want to be drawing or pulling the breath in um because then we might need to push or push or drive the breath out which is not what we want um so um yes i think this kind of 360 expansion and not just about the diaphragm would be what i would get people thinking about in fact Thinking about the legs is also really important because we have that psoas muscle that runs from the legs up through and connects into the uh, crural spine at a very similar point to the diaphragm. So if we don't think about our legs, we could be going, you know, hell for leather thinking about releasing our tummies when actually we are, you know, locked some, somewhere else in the body. So, yeah, thinking about the whole body um, is really important with a efficient optimized inhale hey you if you're enjoying the singing teachers talk podcast then don't forget to hit the subscribe button we are committed to bringing you engaging conversations and valuable insights from experts across the field of voice by subscribing it means we can continue to do that you'll never miss an episode and you'll be helping to spread the word to other singing teachers vocal coaches and overall voice nerds so subscribe to this channel now and just watch your teaching grow. How would you actually help people to find, say, more expansion in their back or ribs or belly? Do you have a particular exercise that kind of hits all points at once or do you go individually? Uh, and, and if there's something that you do that's not hands-on that maybe people could take into a, into the studio lesson where they don't involve touch, what would that be? Yeah, so in MDH breathing coordination itself, there's over a hundred procedures that we learn to guide specific needs of the individual. So if, for example, someone was very um, locked or held or felt like they couldn't get any movement in their back when they when they breathe, there's specific specific procedures that are there to guide the ribs in the direction that we want them to go in. Um, but you know to to test how much flexibility or freedom you have on yourself um you can you can easily check that by using your hands so if you put the back of your hand behind you where you would like right across the middle of the back in that thoracic spine um and then if you just take a breath in and if you feel it expand towards your hand then that's giving you a pretty good idea that you've got some movement there and Yes, that's the middle of the back. Ideally, we want all the way right from the top um, of the spine down to the bottom of the rib cage. We want movement to happen there. So it's quite difficult to use your own hand. You can wiggle it around to feel. But I think it's quite a nice, comforting tool if you're, you know, just when you're stood in the wings or you're waiting to record someone setting up the band stuff ready for you to do your gig, just literally putting your hand behind you taking a breath in and feeling your ribs expand into your arm is a really good tool of going, I am 360 degrees. We live a lot in our fronts as humans and particularly as singers when we're told to kind of 
sing to the upper circle or sing out to the back of the room. And actually, so many of our tools are behind us. I think 70% of the lungs are in our back. So actually, breathing is more of a back thing than a front thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think, you know, part of it's the context, understanding, um, you know, sort of the the, the science around the anatomy, which is really important, but also finding ways to just remind our body when we've spent a whole day at the laptop and we've got a curved spine and it's all gone very tight and held and then um, coming up to sitting and checking that movement. Now, if it doesn't move, it doesn't mean you're broken. It's the end of your career. There's something wrong with your breathing system. It's just maybe not as optimized as it could be. So that's when we use the table, um, massage table, to um, very gently guide the ribs in the directions that they need to go in to increase uh, mobility. And then quite often I'll do that exercise with someone, they'll sit up and they'll go, oh, now I can feel it move. Um, And it really just needed guiding. um, And we use not just physical guiding, we use visualization. Um, We use a process called ideokinesis which is the idea of movement. So if I was to just guide your ribs with my hands, we might get a little bit of a response. But if I guide my ribs and I give you a visualization, I don't know, let's imagine a lift going down as you exhale, then you can actually help me move your body in the direction we want it to go in. And is it a case of actually physically guiding through visualization, I'm just thinking of um, Robert Susuma's Feldenkrais breathing in a box where you kind of use visualization to think about the air being put into the back or put into the ribs or falling down into the tummy. Is it that sort of idea would also work? Yeah. So it's finding something that works for you. So um, quite often we ask the kind or the student what do you like the sensation of what do you like the idea of because there's nothing worse than me saying think of it like this and you're like well I don't at all relate to that that seems weird to me and some things actually could trigger people so you know we really want to use um visualizations and stories that stick for people and that and that work so you know we could do that again with like we put our hand behind us across the middle of our back and we were just going to do a a slow, steady hiss. And then we let the inhale in. I could ask you, what do you notice when you're hissing? When you do that, when you do that hiss, what do you notice? So do you feel anything happening in your back ribs when you do that? Yeah, I can feel it slowly coming in coming in okay and if we were to redesign that even with even more detail ideally we want a sense of almost like the ribs are descending going down so i might ask you what do you like the idea of oil butter or honey what's the sensation that you like the idea of butter yeah honey can go in the bin (laughs) okay although not that the bees we need the bees but i don't want the honey but that's why it's really important to ask because if I said to you, oh, think of honey dribbling down your back and you're like, I hate honey. That, that isn't going to work with me. So you said butter, right? So we'll go with like slightly melty. We put it in a pan. It's starting to go a bit um, gooey and, and shiny and lovely. So we're going to do the hiss again, but I want you to imagine that there's a, a waterfall of butter dribbling down between your arm and your ribs. So as you do the hiss... We're letting that butter dribble down and let the ribs gently lengthen. So that's what we want from the ribs on the exhale. And then when you breathe in, that might then find a space for the breath to go into in the back. So then what we're doing is we're giving people tools rather than breathe into your back, breathe into your back, breathe into your back. You're like, I literally can't. Then we're giving them a tool to go, okay, let's see if we can create space and remind the body of the path it needs to take. And Robin DeHouse's book is Path of the Voice. So um, find that path. And that ideokinesis, the idea of movement, helps you stimulate what we want the anatomy to do. Either I'm really well-influenced 
<laughs> but I really liked the butter, the butter falling down. I could actually feel it was more of like a lift or like a, yeah, like a lift in a hotel going down. Um, oh. And then the recoil, I could feel that there for sure. And then when you, when, when you next, you know, uh, are working on a song or you're, you just want to work on your breath, let's say you just want to work on your breath and you want to work on your exhale. And you said to me, if we were working together, it sounds like, or it feels like a lift to me. When we're doing our breathing exercises together, I'd be like, cool, let's, let's think of that lift and going down. <laughs> we can even have a bit of fun with it, lift going down. And then you get this like lovely visualization that springs back to you. Wow, brilliant. You mentioned the diaphragm earlier. It's like, let's not just think about the diaphragm. And as it's described again on, on the NDH Breathing Coordination website, it says one aim of this work is to amplify and harmonize the movement of the diaphragm to restore the entire breath function. And I'm sure we've all heard the phrase, sing from your diaphragm at some point in our careers. And, you know, most recently I heard it in Emily in Paris. I don't know if you've watched Emily in Paris, but Aww. I highly recommend anyone check that out because it's just lovely. Emily Cooper says it to her friend Mindy, who has just got this job at a club where she has to sing topless and she can't do it when she's exposed. And Emily says, I thought you sang from your diaphragm. I was like, no, Emily, no, we don't. <laughs> so can you just actually describe and clear up for us what's the role of the diaphragm and what does it do? Right, yeah. So, um, well, for, first of all, we don't have that sort of direct you know we can't stick a you can't feel it we can't we can't put a stick in and tickle it and you know it's it's and it's not something we can directly put our hands on obviously but it is connected to so many other things that we um do have some autom autonomy over um and I think you know saying that it's you know because I remember back in the day we'd be like it's the d word don't mention the diaphragm and it's like it's there it's doing a, it can be doing a great job for us I think it's just making sure that it is integrated and coordinated that is the key. Putting it in a little box and just working on the diaphragm is just hopeless because it's so connected to other things. So I often find like actually working around the outside of it, you know, when you've got like a, a neck pain and if you just spent ages like stretching on the neck, it can kind of almost like make it a bit worse. So actually just going around the outside and um, literally and working around it can really help guide it. We ideally want this glide. We want a glide between the diaphragm and the ribs. Um, and in MDH breathing coordination, we call it like a double dome, like glide. Um, so we're trying to encourage this glide, this gliding relationship of the diaphragm. Um, and that's why it's so important what we're doing with the ribs, because if the ri ribs are either a bit rotated or held or um, flared at the front, all of those things can really inhibit the gliding function of the diaphragm going up and then back down again. So the best thing someone can do, I think, to help their diaphragm is to build a better relationship with their ribs and all the other functions outside of that. So there is a lot of sense in when people say, don't lock your knees. Well, what do you actually mean? Because the knees aren't connected to here, but the knees locking will then potentially inhibit the um, movement of the pelvis or the position of the pelvis which then can inhibit the position of your spine which can then inhibit the position of the ribs which can then inhibit the position of you know how the spine relates up into the front of where we make sound so um, a roundabout answer is make better friends with your ri ribs and make a bigger effort in listening to what your body wants if you feel like you're doing loads of release at the front of your body, ask where you might have been slightly neglecting in your body. Like, where can I um, create some flexibility so we can get the diaphragm to glide as smoothly as it, it can? Um, and sometimes when people feel like they're getting a bit stuck or locked in that function or that movement of a glide, it could be that there's something going on in terms of um, the way that glide is allowed to move. So sometimes we see a slight rotation in ribs um, where they're not nicely smooth in that basket I talked about earlier. They're sometimes slightly rotated, which can mean the diaphragm is almost like stopped in its path, um, which can sometimes feel like we're not able to get a nice long exhale. Um, so, yeah, essentially it's there to work 
in line and connected to the ribs. Um, and I love this phrase that there are no empty spaces in the body. I think sometimes we can think like we've got the diaphragm here and then the lungs here and the heart here and everything is pressing up and gliding against something else. Um, and that smooth journey is what's going to give us the control and moment to make a decision of what we're doing with our airflow. If we push and pull and yank and, you know, things um, dramatically, we can often or sometimes add muscle tension we don't need. And we can sometimes drive the air incredibly fast, which is not giving us a chance to make choices at the vocal cords. So for me, I think it's about a glide, a smooth gliding function, functional movement of, of the diaphragm. You mentioned just before there about how we can find a better connection to the back. And you mentioned a downward movement, which you took us through with a bit of visualization there with the oil honey butter. Can you help us understand the other movements that we might want to see with the ribs and maybe the tummy and how we can help a singer connect to those? Mm, yeah, definitely. So again, I would go to I would go to hands on again to first check in what somebody is feeling. Um, and we can do that all together. Um, so just by placing our hands on the front and back of our body, um, I'm I will just start um by saying that we can sometimes get quite comfortable with putting the hand on the front of the tummy, um, which is fine. It's not wrong, but it's just the one angle that we have available to us. So I would put one hand um, on your, where the ribs start to separate. So you've got that little kind of um, arch where the ribs separate and that's where the diaphragm runs along that arch. So just putting one hand at the front and then putting the other hand behind you. So almost like you're giving yourself a little hug. Like a sandwich. Like a sandwich. There you go. Yeah, a diaphragm sandwich. Or a I like how you went hug and I went sandwich. I'm I'm not even hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so getting that kind of all the way around. So my hands are, are like this around me. Uh, just make sure it's comfortable on your shoulders. Um, and just make sure that you're kind of letting your weight go into the chair. But when we take the breath in... Where do we feel the movement go? Does it mainly go in the front? Does it mainly go in the back? And just do a few of those. Sometimes we do one and we're like, oh, no, it's broken. It doesn't move in the back at all. And actually, if we just do two or three more, we're like, oh, yeah, it does actually. So just seeing where moves in the body is a really good um, checking. So are you feeling that all the way around or is it more in one part of the body than another? I feel it exclusively frontal. Right. And, you know, that can be based on like things that we've done habitually over the years, training, all those kind of things. Again, not wrong. There's no shame in that at all. It's, it's literally, we're just listening. We're seeing mm -hmm. what the body's saying. And then if we were to do like a little wriggle in your spine, so imagine you've got a nice kind of chilled, chilled tra track on in the background that you're vibing out to. And then just do a few more of those inhales and just see, do you feel a little bit more go into the back when you start that little wriggle? So keep the wriggle going whilst you're doing the inhale. And just see if you get any more movement into the back. A little bit. A little bit. So you could integrate this, maybe just making sure that you do add a little bit of movement into this kind of check-in. Um, and then we're going to put the other hand or the front hand up to here. So just on your chest, I'm being a little bit mindful of my microphone, but essentially on the chest where your hand is great. Yeah, exactly. And then we're just going to take a breath in again and see where do we feel movement. So bearing in mind, our ribs start right up under those collarbones. So if we're not thinking about the top ribs moving, we are inhibiting a really important part of our ribs. And remember yeah. we said the ribs are a basket, not a cage. So we've got to be a little bit mindful saying to people, don't move this bit. I think that's where it can get confusing, can't it? Because when we talk about things like splat breaths, for example, or we talk about high clavicular breathing, it can mm -hmm. it can make people think that they're not allowed any movement in their chest. Yeah. But as you say, it's it's 
the rib cage is still attached there. So we we do still like to have that movement there. It might just not be that the, the, the shoulders get shoved up. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, so just because we're moving the top ribs doesn't mean we are um, lifting and pulling at the shoulder girdle. So oh. yeah, allowing this. Yeah, someone once said to me, um, it was a physio actually, imagine you're breathing without arms. <laughs> So see if you can feel a little expansion under your hand at the front and feel a little expansion in your back. And again, there's no, you know, we're not shaming anything here if we don't feel movement straight away. We're just giving the message to the body, what can we feel? So do you feel a little kind of expansion or movement into your front hand there? Yeah, definitely. I can feel that at the chest. I still don't feel very much in my back. So that's where we would then go on to explore guiding the ribs so that you can start to feel that movement a little bit more mm. but even that little oh I do feel a little something we can welcome that we can we can um invite a bit more of that in so when you are um, feeling that expansion front and back that is physiologically a really good thing to think about bringing us 360 degrees and using that wriggle I mean I find myself doing this <laughs> nearly all day long so it's a really nice way to keep freedom and where we are moving we're potentially not gripping mm -hmm. so just putting your hands front and back is a really good starting point um and you can lower that top hand down towards the um uh, bottom of the rib cage into more of the abdomen if that's another place you want to check in so rather than going this is where we breathe it's more a case of where do I want to, where's offering me movement today? So you might find today, because you've made, I'm just hypothesizing, but if you've been sat for long periods, there might be a bit of compression in your back. You might have been maybe leaning over your laptop so it's compressed a bit. So your back might not be offering you that part of your breathing system as much as maybe your top ribs are. So I don't think we should be saying to people, this is where we breathe. It's where am I, what is offering me Um a uh, possibility of breath today so it's the same sort of thing with the support system not are you supporting or are you breathing but where are you supporting and where are you breathing yeah. is what I think we should be asking each other as singers and you know if for example let's say 80% of your breath system is really working well let's identify where it isn't okay so maybe in the the middle of your back where those mid ribs are you're not getting as much expansion as you could let's give you an exercise whether it be something like we just did earlier with the oil and the butter and the honey idea or you have a session where someone will manually help you remember help your body remember what it needs to do so that you can get that um bit closer to fully optimized breathing mm -hmm. and this one here where we're we're kind of putting our hands on body this one I can imagine we can do quite slowly and we can feel a, a slower breath coming into the system or however you want to kind of explore that. Is, would this also work for finding quicker breaths or mm. if somebody's working in Hamilton or on a patter song, is there a different approach for what people might call snatch breaths or quick breaths or is that a different thing? No, it's a really good question. So I'm working mainly with sort of contemporary musical theatre, pop, and we need that quick rhythmic breath. And it's a common question I get asked is, well, this is all lovely doing these slow, you know, listening and feeling where the breath's going, but I need to do a quick inhale because I'm going to be doing a long, like, rap-like or, you know, very rhythmic vocal. And the answer is the more we make the body flexible and responsive um to the breath and that inhale function the quick the, the quicker it can respond so the more we work on that we can if the body's flexible and responsive it can go quickly for an inhale or it can move slowly for an inhale so the more we work on that coordination and release the more it can respond to the thought and really if we think about breath as a thought, the body can respond. So if I have a quick thought of something wonderful that I want to tell you, the body can respond to the quick thought. Or maybe it's a slow thought of something you're conjuring up and the body can respond. But that has to be done through um, making sure the body is mobile, flexible, released, and also supported in the right places. 
How does that work with somebody who might have a condition like scoliosis or um, another curvature, like a, a big curvature of the spine, anything like that? Yeah. Um, so again, this is where it's really great where we're taking individual things into consideration of each person's body because being told to sit up straight would very much not work for someone, you know, with that curvature. We'd need to work with the natural curves of the body. Um, the same thing of, you know, if we sit up straight as, you know, someone that's um, not got scoliosis, you know, again, you can like hyperextend mm -hmm. and take the body out of its um, optimized place. So I would say that it's really important to get a full information about the person as much as possible at the start of working with someone. Um, but then after that, acknowledging that we are trying to optimize and optimize is where someone is and making their body and what they have available to them their best. When we go to the doctors, we make art with a broken arm, for example, they fix the arm. They don't make us an athlete with that arm. They don't make it athletic. So we work with the, um, let's say the kind of scaffolding or the kind of the, the function, not the function, the anatomy that the person has right now and optimize that to whatever the best that could be within the curvatures of the spine of whatever it or whatever condition that they might have. Mm -hmm. And I always, um, what I love about the work is that MDH breathing coordination is a communicate, a community of specialists. So mm -hmm. if I'm unsure of something, I have physiotherapists that specialize in this work, uh, psychologists that specialize in this work for me to refer um, this is more internationally at the moment um, to get second opinions and also refer on. So um, it's not that I'm absolutely weighted with, you know, I, I do have knowledge of scoliosis and working with people with special um, or, or certain requirements. But yeah, I, I think sometimes it can feel a bit lonely as a teacher that I need to have the answers myself or I need to go and I don't know, maybe sheepishly ask someone else to, what do you think? But actually, I think confidently being encouraged that you should, we really should ask others if we're unsure, because otherwise we can cause more problems, right? And how about taking a breath through the mouth or through the nose? And we had a focus on day a while back now at BAST talking about breathing and optimizing breathing. And we had Patrick McCohen on to talk about nasal breathing and and mouth breathing so what's your take on that should we be mouthing it or or nosing it yeah um i think this is where there's that kind of uh creative arts slash sports overlap um from my knowledge you know the the nose is incredible powerful tool for as a filtering system and with sports in particular you know i i know that a lot of practitioners really lean into the the nasal breath but in my experience in being in the performance industry, when we have a thought, it's more often than not a a, a mouth breath, a, a thought comes in through the mouth, that inspiration. Um, and that makes sense, right? Because we're inspiring to respond. Um, so when it comes to doing uh, breathing exercises on the table, whether we're using um, specific techniques to realign the breathing system, I might alternate between nose and mouth. But when it comes back to gradually honing the voice back to voicing, we start to look at um, using the mouth a little bit more in terms of um, the idea of voice because we are wanting to respond after breathing. But I do always check in with each individual, like how does a nasal breath feel if people have got restriction? How does a mouth breath feel? Um, and then, of course, there are some, you know, if we're doing lots of mouth breathing, it can be quite drying. Um, we can sometimes, if we breathe in through the nose, over pull um, and sort of hyperinflate the body. So it's a kind of one by one um, check in for me with an individual. But I generally would say that if you had a thought you wanted to express to someone or someone walked out in front of a bus and you wanted them to stop, you would probably um, do a mouth breath. But I know that it is an individualized thing. This is all really well and good doing the, the expansions and things. But the thing that trips me up is when 
I know that that performer is going off to dance and sing at the same time, or they're, they've got like Pink is doing a trapeze performance during her sets. So I've just got a couple of fictional studies here, and I'd love to know how you would work with these people in optimizing their breath for what they're about to go and do and what that means based on what we've just spoken about. So I'm being biased putting this one number one, but it's it's just where I work. So musical theatre performer who dances, who is likely to have to have somewhat of a held front in their core. What would you say on that? Yeah, interesting one. So I think I would work out first what that, but what pulling up or held uh, means to them where they feel that happening um and then I would look around well how does that man manifest when you breathe and how does it manifest when you voice so like we said earlier the voice is the breath made audible so if we're hearing constriction if we're hearing um inconsistencies in the voice um then I would take a step back and see okay so when you breathe where are we feeling movement and where are we where is it feeling held and then I would take a step back from that and then um, start getting that person working with um, finding ways to uh, what is it we're actually trying to do is it that we want to look like we're held up there is it for stability so what's the reason behind that and if it's about stability and strength is there a little bit of that that we can let go and still get the same result? And is there another part of your breathing system we can tap into if you're having to really engage and, and have a little bit more of that kind of front dominant movement? Is there um, a freeing up that we can do in the back? So I would really make sure that someone is, a, as, as a dancer, which we see really often flaring the ribs at the front and then really closing off the breathing function at the back so bringing them back to that 360 degree thing. And actually, I think muscle recruitment isn't always a bad thing as long as it's not inhibiting the movement somewhere else. So we see that quite often, don't we, in the West End where singers are asked to do quite extravagant movements or be in quite extravagant positions where we're inhibiting what we might like to think of our lovely 360 degree breath. But actually, if someone's, I think I had that like a few years ago when someone had to be a bird on their side and belt a really, I think it was like a top E or something like in a weird position. Well, can we be creative and find another um, movement potential in that person's body? So yes, they're inhibiting the side of their ribs, but could they breathe into another part of that um, rib basket that we talked about? And can we give them an exercise to have a switch off as well as when they have their switch on? That's quite similar then to the actor uh, who might also say, uh, for some reason, the, the play that comes to mind is Burkhoff's interpretation of Kafka's Metamorphosis, where the character is a salesman who transforms into a beetle and ends up performing in all these contorted postures mm -hmm. and how they breathe and deliver their text in that way. So with... All of this, would you say it's a case of in finding the most flexible read up 360 expansion as you can and then adapt knowing that you've got that so that when you go into a position, a posture or something that's compromising a part of that system, we can call upon other available parts because if they're never available, they're never going to be available when you're, you know, dying on the barricade. But if they are through practice, we know our ways through the body to get to them to help us in those moments. Exactly. Yeah. Navigating what's available to us to offer us um, support and uh, breath management in that moment. And I think just making sure that we're using really helpful words with that, because, you know, if someone is contracted on one side and in a strange position, trying to breathe efficiently for voicing, if we then tell them to contract something, then the body doesn't always direct contraction to the area that you're wanting it to go to. If you say contract something that's already a little bit punchy, we'll probably contract too. So I think actually being really specific is the key. So if someone has got lots of um, 
yeah, but, I mean, exactly. I agree. Like getting this sort of flexibility and reset of optimizing before we sing and when we perform is great to do. Making sure that when we're actually doing it, we know where we're directing the breath and the air pressure to. And then once we finish that task, how can we unravel and undo anything that might have started to create a little bit of a pathway that we don't necessarily want? So if we've been contracted on one side, can we find a way to re find a way back to that flexibility and mobility? Uh, because you know we don't we all want to be creative. We don't want to be like I'm not doing that role because I'm a bit I have to perform in this way. It's how can we um, maintain uh, as balanced set up as we can from start to finish of the role and then sometimes I do see clients after they've been in a specific role and we just need to unravel the character from their body and kind of get their breath back to optimize before they go and maybe re-audition for another role or new new project. I had some other case studies in like as I mentioned the commercial artist who might be performing a trapeze like pink or the opera singer who's wearing a corset and a wig is it the same approach for those performers as well? Is it just the case of re-optimizing once they've come off stage on that, but main, finding a way for them to breathe optimally whilst they're in that costume whilst, or whilst they're on that trapeze? Yeah, I think that's where the partnership can really come into play because if someone comes into me and they say, well, I'm having to wear this particular outfit um, or this particular costume and I'm feeling that and fighting against it let's say a car a, a corset for example i think actually re-illuminating to the client where so asking them the question where do you feel like you're breathing into oh well i'm i'm really inhibited in my back okay so what is available to you oh my top ribs are kind of out of the corset okay so let's see if we can get even more flexibility and freedom in those top ribs to serve you in this show and then like you said let's see if we can give you some exercises to really free up the ribs after um and I think a lot of this actually does this is probably another talk but really tie into how we're using the support system as well mm -hmm. so and we can get all our breathing right but then if that breath work isn't coordinated with whatever you as a singer um call support then um you know that they're not mutually reinforcing one another. So, um, yeah, just making sure that everything is serving one another. And if there are some compromises that are made, um, not because we can't go to the director and say this person's not doing this. We have to work um, wherever it seems possible to to get the body and the function to serve the character or the or the song. Uh, but yeah, then afterwards, just resetting. Wow. This will come really handy for teachers who are working with trans masculine singers as well. I can imagine who those singers who might be wearing a, a chest binder. We spoke with Stephen Davidson for our podcast recently on the trans masculine voice um, and just maybe helping those singers to find an optimized breathing mechanism, which doesn't draw attention to the fact that they're maybe wearing a chest binder and how that relates to the difficulties that they're experiencing through transition yeah yeah definitely and I think the way we you know identify with our bodies you know we can often get told to really release the belly really release the tummy and you know some people just don't feel comfortable about comfortable about really you know overextending that part of their body particular to particular times of the month mm -hmm. and particularly if you're really trying to redesign or 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 connect with your body and your your gender and you know really find um really connect to that and I think you know if we can find ways to individualize uh how we breathe and make sure that works with the person and how they feel in themselves I think that's really important otherwise you can be doing one thing and then feeling really uncomfortable physiologically um at the same time so yeah I think getting people to uh or starting to kind of communicate with people of what feels good to you like does how does that make you feel to think about expanding at that part of your body or 
contracting that part of your body. And yeah, with the binders, there's obviously that real <laughs> constriction. Um, but actually, you know, seeing a good thing that's serving them in their journey there. And actually, how can we redesign that so we're not fighting the binder, but maybe we're breathing into the binder or we're making friends, letting our ribs make friends with with the binder. So it's like, I think, retelling that story in a more positive way. Um, yeah, to try and make them them work together rather than against. Mm. Lucinda Allen, this has been so great chatting about this topic and understanding how we can take the most optimal inhale for our bodies. You don't have a choice. You have to come back and talk to us about expiration and this uh, divisive word support, please. I'd be delighted. No, it's just, you know, we've all got lots of different journeys on all this work and you know, I think if we can share in, in a platform like you guys are providing, then that's, yeah, that's the reason that I've gone into working in education as well, because we can collaborate and share and, you know, eagerness sharing is what I'm about. So I'm yeah. going to do more of that. Here, here. Well, Lucinda Allen, where can people find out more about your work and get in touch with you until the next time you're on? <laughs> and so I, um, I have my website, which is uh, voiceunlocked.com. Um, on Instagram, Voice Unlocked as well, if you want to follow and um, make contact there. Um, I'm also on the MDH Breathing Coordination Practitioner uh, list as well. So if you're more interested in the work, I'm um, happy to share more about that. Um, and I think there will be some workshops coming up in uh, the UK before the end of the year, if anyone's interested. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Do 